are in a hybrid mode, meaning that some people are following this press conference on the website. And I'm really happy to tell you that we are web streaming this on EU Voice, which is an alternative media that we started uh, with the EDPS and other EU institution last year, together with uh, Mastodon, so EU Voice, so EU Voice, EU Video. So I'm really happy that we are, let's say, uh, putting into practice what we are promoting over the year. So um, I will introduce you to first to the supervisor, Mr. Vivirovsky, who will present today uh, his annual report for 2022. It will be a presentation of 15, 20 minutes maximum, and then we will pass the floor to you so that we can answer questions that you have in mind. We have also Kazik, is um, uh, working in the, in the cabinet of Mr. Vivirovsky, and Agnieszka Nika, who is working together with me in the information and communication unit. So I will start by uh, asking you a question, uh, uh, Wojciech. You uh, write in your foreword of the annual report that uh, last year, 2022, has been an eventful year. Challenging, hopeful, difficult, but encouraging. Both for the world at large and also for DDPS. Can you tell us a bit more about this? Uh, first, first of all, let me say good morning to, to all of you and uh, thank again uh, for being with us uh, either here in the uh, press center or uh, online. Well, indeed, that was the eventful uh, year, uh, 2022, even if we count only the, the legislative proposals which were on the uh, table of the European legislator, we have to say about the Digital Services Act, Digital Market Act, Data Act, uh, the, uh, Data Governance Act, uh, Artificial Intelligence Act, uh, Artificial Intelligence Liability Act, uh, and the number of the specific solutions uh, per sectors which are also touching the uh, data uh, uh, protection and uh, including the personal data. Uh, but this is also the, the year where we had the first binding decisions uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, which were directed to uh, Europol, uh, especially to, to so-called big data challenge. Uh, that was also the year of the audits that we did in Frontex in in EU LISA, including uh, 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 Schengen Information System, Visa Information System, and Eurodac. Uh, these were the first cases to the Court of Justice, uh, as, uh, uh, in the Court of Justice uh, against uh, the European Data Protection Board. Uh, that was also the, the first time that we, as EDPS, uh, took the legislator to the court uh, uh, for the uh, for the uh, new regulation on Frontex, or rather amendments of the regulation of Frontex. Uh, that was also the, the year of the National Judicial Review of the GDPR, uh, and uh, many of the uh, of the decisions, uh, uh, the judgments of the courts in the national jurisdictions uh, had a, a really an impact on the discussion. But we have to remember also about the political uh, developments uh, in this uh, time. We had uh, the new transatlantic uh, uh, framework uh, for data transfers, which was under preparation and uh, the, the the proposal on how to how to have it uh, and how the decision of the of the uh, uh, of the commission will look like also appeared in 2022. Uh, standard contractual clauses for Ibero-American uh, Ibero American uh, countries uh, for the for Council of Europe. Uh, our conference on the future of uh, data protection and enforcement uh, in data protection. Also, EU video and uh, EU voice that you said about uh, that was, that were also the kind of events uh, when we are talking about uh, the, the privacy-friendly way of uh, dealing with the new media. And finally, the developments in the in the technology uh, or the kind of democratization of some of these developments, because when we talk about ChatGPT, which also somehow erupted uh, at the end of uh, 2022, that, that was not the new uh, uh, development, that was rather the democratization of the development which existed so far for the, uh, for the uh, commercial users or for the big uh, companies or for the, uh, or for the researchers. Now uh, people could see how you can use this uh, uh, the, this uh, new technologies and new models uh, for the everyday life purposes so uh, you started to be profiled not only by the uh, big players but also by your neighbors and uh, uh, by your landlord 
So uh, yes, that was an eventful year, but uh, what uh, still keeps me uh, very optimistic uh, about uh, the, the, the uh, development of the privacy law and data protection law is that in all these events uh, and all these uh, uh, situations, <coughs> the, the data protection issues and privacy issues were taken into consideration. And even uh, when we think about the big geopolitical situation with the war in uh, Ukraine, with the Russian invasion, uh, we also had a lot of uh, privacy issues which were connected with it, uh, starting with the data of the people who are the, who are the refugees uh, and uh, continuing with the special efforts of the European Union institutions uh, towards uh, the seizure of the uh, of the uh, evidence of the war crimes uh, in Ukraine and the work that we did uh, uh, together with uh, uh, Eurojust uh, in order to prepare it uh, from the privacy point of view. So yes, that was an eventful year. Wojciech, thank you very much. If we look uh, back uh, last year, some of you remember uh, EDPS organized a very large and successful conference on two days on the 16th and 17th of June about the future of data protection and the effective enforcement in the digital age. I want to take it from there, um, Wojciech. What has been done, uh, for, because you started basically the discussion, the conversation, the actions about this, what has been done uh, since then and how do you see the evolution and the future enforcement of the GDPR four years after its entry into application? Uh, we definitely have to divide it into two bigger groups. Uh, uh, the, the first is what we can do right now with this uh, legal uh, ground that we have. Uh, uh, with the GDPR being in the center of that, uh, and uh, which uh, steps we still have to take in order to implement the GDPR in the proper way. But also the, the, the a little bit long, uh, longer perspective uh, where we can uh, discuss about, prepare ourselves to the discussion on the possible changes or evolution of the systems uh, uh, that uh, were created in Europe. So uh, the asking for this, uh, in inviting the people to this conference in June, we wanted to touch especially the second part, so the long range uh, discussion. But uh, it also triggered uh, some uh, very uh, constructive discussion on the current situation. And uh, the European Data Protection Board decided preparing to somehow to this discussion to organize this summit of the data protection authorities uh, in Vienna in April last year, where the short-term goals have been, uh, have been uh, established. Not only some changes in the procedures, uh, which were then taken by the European Commission, and uh, soon we will see uh, the proposal, the, the draft of the legal act, uh, harmonizing uh, some of the uh, procedural uh, procedural differences, but also the discussion about coordinated enforcement actions, about the uh, strategic cases, uh, list of strategic cases, uh, and uh, 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 this uh, uh, started uh, the discussion on still uh, remaining uh, points to be implemented. That also means uh, the uh, codes of conduct or certification which still didn't reach the level which was uh, uh, which was uh, envisaged in the gdpr itself but uh, uh, this conference as i said ha had a little bit longer perspective we have to remember that uh, next year there is an uh, there are elections to the european parliament we will also have the new commission and let's say the years 2024, 25, 20, until 29, that will be another uh, era of the discussion about uh, the privacy and data protection solutions in the European Union. I hope it will be based on what we have in GDPR, but we are not excluding the discussion about uh, the uh, further developments uh, in this uh, area. Wojciech, thank you very much. I have a, a third and last question to you, and then we open the floor to, uh, uh, to the audience, to the, the journalists here present. Um, Wojciech, you are the Data Protection Authority supervising EU institutions, bodies, and agencies. You like to say that this role comes with a sense of responsibility in a democratic society. How do you translate this aspiration into daily action? I would stress the fact that uh, the European approach to data protection 
uh, both presented by the European Union, but also by the Council of Europe, uh, that's the only regional approach uh, which is dealing not only with the data protection in the market, uh, but also among the public authorities. We don't have it the same way in the United States. We don't have it the same way in the uh, in many Asian systems, for example, uh, the, which exclude the supervision over the public authorities. In Europe, we treat the public authorities the same way as we treat uh, the market players. So for EU institutions, it means that we should be leading by example. It, it's a nice word, leading by example. But what it means, it means that uh, the role of the regulator of the EU institutions in this field is to be sure that all the principles which are working uh, in the data protection law are fully, uh, uh, fully implemented in the work of the institutions. So just to give the kind of extreme example, if you have the, the uh, judgment like the judgment in Schrems 2 case, uh, it also applies to the Court of Justice. So the Court of Justice has to uh, uh, has to be in co has to be compliant with its own uh, with its own judgments, but they are fully aware of that. And the work with the Court of Justice might be a very good example of uh, making the practical use uh, uh, of the EU institutions being uh, aware of their role in the data protection. Wojciech, thank you very much. I think we were fine. You were quite uh, straightforward in your answers. And um, as you have, I mean, you will see in our annual report of last year, we are covering a lot of uh, topics. So now comes the time for you to ask questions. Um, if uh, you would agree on that, please, when you ask your question, first introduce yourself so that we know exactly uh, who you are. Okay. Who wants to kick off? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Th there is a microphone here. Yes, I, I, Nikolai Nielsen, EU Observer. I had a question concerning uh, the EU um, AI Act. Uh, Amnesty International sent a, a letter to the rapporteurs yesterday um, saying that uh, uh, there should be a prohibition when it comes to um, the profiling uh, of, of migrants. Um, and, um, and I was wondering if you could uh, address some of the concerns you have there as well, if that's an issue that, that, is, um, that you uh, think is important to, to follow. Thank you somehow understand that there are two questions because uh, you mean uh, our uh, our role in uh, supervision of ai and our uh, think our thoughts about ai but also uh, or and the second uh, about the migrants well um i was wondering or uh, if you if thought this... ai maybe you thought uh, amnesty international sorry <laughs> sorry so AI that you said about uh, that's uh, artificial intelligence? Ar or yes, artificial intelligence, exactly. Okay. When it comes to profiling of migrants and asylum seekers, and what, what, what would you be your role in supervising something like this? I mean, perhaps it's, it's Frontex, I don't know. And, and what are the, some of the risks that you see uh, in, this, in, 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 the, in this act? Thank we, you. We have quite a lot of, uh, quite a big role in supervision of the uh, of the EU institutions, as far as the data protection is concerned, in the migration uh, in migration sector, but it will be of course bigger when we will go to the artificial intelligence act. First of all, I'm not in favor of any exceptions, uh, any general exceptions for law enforcement authorities uh, or for authorities that are dealing with the uh, border control. Uh, if we think about any kind of uh, uh, exceptions done in the Artificial Intelligence Act, they should be very limited and strictly, uh, strictly interpreted. So in this sense, all the law enforcement authorities shall be also under the, uh, under the rules of the Artificial Intelligence Act. That of course means that we have to make the regulatory framework for that, and EDPS is ready to take this role in the European Union, also as far as this uh, migration sector is uh, concerned. But uh, we have to remember that that's slightly different situation for the uh, EDPS than for the national data protection authorities, though many of them also said that they are ready to take this role. We had these declarations from Italian Garante, from uh, Dutch authority, from CNIL, French authority. Uh, but uh, of course, the role of EDPS, the situation of EDPS is uh, 
a little bit easier, if we can say about easiness of the situation here, because we have just 70 institutions to uh, supervise and none of them is, produce, is developing the software for the market. So if we have a situation that they will, that they will produce the software which is then reused by the other entities, that will be rather exceptions. While for the national authorities, this will be dozens of thousands of the, uh, of the ones who develop and millions of users. Uh, so the, uh, to playing the role of the regulator of uh, fundamental right, uh, as it is at the moment, uh, and the market surveillance authority at the same time will be much bigger, uh, much bigger uh, challenge uh, for the national authorities. But as EDPS, uh, EDPS is ready to take this role and uh, somehow remembers that uh, the role of the data protection authorities will change in the nearest future. And we either have to evolve or we have to extinct. So uh, I guess the, the, the um, scope of the uh, data protection authorities uh, uh, tasks uh, will be growing. I'm Lorne Cook with the Associated Press. If I could just follow up on the migration uh, issue more generally, could you talk about any concerns that you might have uh, in terms, and, I, and I'm thinking of issues, um, border controls at the external borders, and I don't know how uh, migrants fit into the great scheme of things as European citizens, well, they're not European citizens, but once they're on European territory. Um, so what I'd be interested in is, is things like international transfers of their data once it's been collected. Is that problematic? Or some of perhaps the technologies that we're seeing being used uh, on the borders, are these setting precedents that might be dangerous uh, for European citizens in terms of their data being used? Uh, let me start from the very general uh, observation. Uh, once again, we have to be sure that the difference between the EU standards and the standards of the other um, regional uh, organizations or other countries uh, is that we treat uh, the people who are uh, who are not the citizens of the European Union the same way as we treat the Europeans. So uh, the European Union institutions uh, shall remember that the data protection uh, and privacy is the fundamental right and fundamental right knows, knows no citizenship. So it means that we have to apply it uh, to uh, all the solutions that we do also for the externals. Of course, it does not mean that there might be that there should be no exceptions, uh, but they should be once again very well written in the law and uh, observed and interpreted in the very restrictive way. So then, going to the practice, it means also that uh, we have to look at the uh, at the uh, procedures, but also behavior of the EU institutions and national institutions at the border. Uh, uh, external border of the EU and at the same time we have to look at the technologies which are there there in use we uh, and uh, finally the point that you said so the possible data transfers which are connected with it uh, we can uh, give the example of the big audit that we did in Frontex last year and which uh, uh, conclusions uh, will be uh, published soon we are just uh, preparing the final version of the report to be sent to Frontex first, uh, but uh, uh, definitely there are there are there is a room for improvement, both uh, in the way that the information is collected and the information is uh, distributed uh, between the EU institutions, uh, national authorities, uh, and uh, also Europol as a hub for the uh, for the law enforcement authorities in, in Europe. Okay. Hi, uh, Dani Rovirosa from the Spanish News Agency EFE. I would like to change uh, the topic. Uh, you were talking about uh, the ChatGPT technologies. I just would like to a reflection from you. If you think uh, data protection authorities of all member states should follow the Italian ban, or it was maybe too early to to take that decision. We decided as a European Data Protection Board to create the task force for this purpose. And the main reason for that is to harmonize approach. Uh, the 
all of the data protection authorities or supervisory authorities are competent here because there is no one-stop shop system to be used since uh, the OpenAI who, who, who uh, introduced it to the market has no establishment in the European Union. So that's why the Garante could take the decision and there are also the in investigations taken in some other countries. And uh, we would like to have a common approach or at least informed approach between the su supervisor authorities uh, on the reflections that we have uh, on this uh, model of uh, dealing with the data and this very development which is uh, which is uh, visible well um, you can see in the decision of the italian data protection authorities uh, what were the main points of interest i'm not uh, in the position of assess what garante did and what was garante's uh, uh, approach we didn't get as edps any complaint yet uh, and uh, we didn't start the ex officio action uh, connected with uh, the chat GPT, but uh, the, I would divide uh, this uh, um, concerns that we have in two groups. Uh, some of them are connected with the fact that this is an AI system, and some of them is, are, are general, I may say. So each uh, big uh, global service uh, uh, may, may cause them. And for example, the problems with the age verification are a little bit broader than only the, for the services which are connected with AI. With AI, for me myself, the biggest concern are so-called uh, uh, so-called uh, um, huh? lost the word uh, hallucinations, hallucinations. So the situations where they were lacking the good uh, resources, uh, the chat GPT tries to invent the answer. And this answer is partly true, partly non-true, and uh, we uh, we have the problems to find out where is the border between the reality and actually kind of fake information that was delivered. So all these hallucinations might be probably the biggest data protection problem because we stop to be sure what is true and what is not true at the, at the same time what can be the purposes that we use this information for. But uh, the list of questions uh, towards uh, uh, open, uh, uh, open AI is much longer. I can, yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, Beth and John from Global Data Review. Um, changing the subject um, again. Um, but please could you outline your thoughts on the um, new privacy shield? Um, so I'm thinking kind of any concerns um, and any maybe discussions that you've had with the commission and others. Um, you know, to what extent has there been, um, you know, pressure to kind of bless the new executive uh, order? I have to say that I see really a big progress uh, and the progress that I didn't expect myself. For a long time, I was saying that uh, there is no change in the policy of the United States as far as the uh, access of secret services to the data of Europeans is concerned, no matter if we have the Amer uh, if we have a Republican or Democratic uh, administration. But this time I have to say there is a change. There is a st st strong, big, uh, new uh, approach uh, from the American side. So while there is not too much change in the commercial aspects of the framework uh, from what we had uh, in the Privacy Shield, definitely both uh, the executive order and the act which was prepared by the attorney general set quite a new standard in the approach to the uh, personal data protection of the, the of the european citizens and uh, in this sense uh, i think that it's a really a big step forward we still have concerns but i guess that these concerns can be uh, solved can be addressed in the review of the uh, new framework but uh, I don't think uh, that there are the uh, obstacles uh, to start to use uh, the uh, decision of the European uh, Commission as long as, uh, sorry, or, or rather, uh, at the moment uh, where the internal acts uh, of the American administration will be uh, issued. So th this implementation acts that we are waiting for. Good morning, Luca Bertuzzi from Iraktiv. Um, can you give us an update about your investigation on the use of cloud services by EU institutions? Well, the only thing which I can say at the moment is that we prepared the preliminary 
uh, findings and the list of preliminary findings was sent to the commission and the commission we are waiting for the answer for, to, from the commission we thought that we will have this answer already now but uh, we got the uh, request for prolonging the uh, the, uh, um, the period for uh, the commission and uh, by the end of may we should get the answer and be ready to issue the decision Thank you very much. Hi, it's Sam Clark from MLEX. Um, just going back to data transfers, um, we've seen some stuff recently on the global CBPR forum, uh, and there's been things like the OECD declaration, uh, and there's also a track to do with data transfers or data flows at the G7. And I wonder if you had any thoughts just generally on this kind of move towards a, a multilateral solution for data flows uh, rather than an EU blessing, maybe a maybe a bilateral deal occasionally. What do you think about that? We are very interested in all the discussions about the global solution, but at the same time, it's quite skeptical about all global solutions. So it means uh, uh, the if we think about uh, going out of the EU zone, going out of the, the classical cooperation that we had uh, with the countries of the Council of Europe, uh, then I'm uh, d definitely in favor of that. So we are both interested in the developments in OECD and developments that are done by the G7 at the moment. Uh, that might be interesting, but uh, some of the directions which are taken uh, are um, a little bit doubtful for us. So going to G20, for example, as the next step is probably not the right direction. We rather pre prefer the discussion inside the OECD, remembering that OECD, these are the guidelines which are not mandatory. So that is only the guideline mode. So uh, we would rather refrain from the from taking interoperability of the solutions for any reason, uh, if we understand it as finding the lowest common denominator for different uh, solutions uh, around the world. But we would rather be in favor of the uh, convergence of the uh, of the regulation around the world. But as I said. I don't expect uh, that all the, the uh, all the countries in the world will take the common approach uh, and joint approach uh, to the privacy and data protection because there are the differences which are very well visible and the formal fact that some uh, that some country has a data protection law does not solve the problem. The implementation of that and the practice is the most important. So we are observing all that. We are observing also the developments as far as standard contractor clauses are concerned. Uh, with CBPR, well, I would love to see the new release of CBPRs uh, and this really global uh, approach to that. But uh, the previous uh, solutions proposed in two issues of the CBPR were definitely not enough to be taken as the uh, as the background for this for these global solutions. Uh, good morning, Matthew Newman from MLEX. Um, I apologize if you've already been asked this question, but there's a meeting tomorrow of stakeholders um, almost across the street in the Centre Bullshit, and it's about um, the vexed issue of targeted advertising and consent. And this has been called by the um, Justice Commissioner, Diddy Reinders, who's interested in looking at this issue of having a voluntary pledge by companies to reduce the number of um, pop-ups. So in other words, uh, companies would uh, get together and say, well, we, we need to have a solution to make it less annoying for consumers. And Didier Reinders is saying that instead of using GDPR or the e-privacy directive or any of the tools that you know about, um, but using more the uh, consumer protection law uh, to approach this cookie fatigue is what uh, what it's called. I was wondering what you think of this approach of using consumer law rather than um, privacy law, data protection law. If this is a a good solution, a complement to data protection, or maybe going in the wrong direction, or how how do you view um, this this uh, latest move? 
Well, I think that the solution with the cookie banners is a little bit orphan in uh, the EU. So everybody says, that's not me who, who wrote it down. So I would like to say the same. That's not me who wrote it down. Uh, I was not preparing the privacy di directive. And uh, uh, I, of course, I'm very sorry that uh, we don't, do not have a privacy regulation still that would probably solve this problem. Uh, that is definitely the problem, and it is, is to, to be solved. So the pro, the proposal from the uh, DG Justice uh, seems to be interesting and let's say uh, promising, uh, and uh, I hope that it will set the new standard uh, as far as the uh, cookie information and information about all kinds of tracking uh, is concerned. Uh, that will uh, that will uh, increase transparency, but reduce the burden. So uh, definitely all the best in this, in this solution, and uh, we are sorry that uh, it was not that we were not able to do it uh, in the e-privacy regulation. I'm not sure if, if you'll be able to answer this one, but I'm interested in um, the developments in COVID. Uh, over time, I remember the the Belgian data protection supervisor was uh, uh, complaining uh, or, or raising concern um, about some of the decrees that were there. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw in Wallonia recently the the um, COVID safe certificate was was overturned. If I go to my doctor or the chemist or or if I go to Media Mark to buy a, a blender, uh, my ID cards looked at. I'm just wondering if you could tell me a little bit about how that's evolved ha has um has the mix of our data the mixing that was needed or, or uh, ostensibly required for for covid restrictions has that stopped has it continued do you have areas of concern there uh, we were concerned about the use of that by the eu institutions so that's the part which we are mapping and which we are trying to follow and uh, i can say that uh, most of the solutions uh, which were inventive for the time of the uh, extraordinary danger have been really removed. So they, they, they do not exist. The data was either uh, erased or anonymized. Uh, but uh, I cannot say the same thing about all the administrations around uh, Europe, of course, and all the uh, jurisdictions. That's also not my role to check it. But uh, we are trying to follow both uh, the uh, the fate, let's say, of the these extraordinary solutions uh, which were in the European Union uh, institutions uh, and uh, try to assess those that uh, played their role, like, for example, these tracking apps uh, and uh, the, uh, the the common framework for tracking, uh, for tracking apps. But uh, the, that is still the part of the discussion in the scientific field and uh, among the statisticians, among the, those who were uh, introducing that into the systems of the uh, of the member states. Uh, as far as the EU institutions are concerned, we may say that most of the extraordinary uh, tools have been already removed, though some of them uh, uh, were actually quite successful. And I think that the all European COVID passport was rather the good experience uh, and something that has shown us that we are able to prepare the solution which is interoperable uh, between all the countries of the EU. Thank you. Um, uh, Beth and John from Global Data Review again. Um, so the Irish Data Protection Authority has um, launched a legal challenge against the EDPB um, over claims that it overstepped its powers um, when it ordered uh, when the body ordered it to launch what it says is a fresh investigation. Um, what does this kind of tell us about the working of the EDPB um, when it comes to GPR inv investigations and enforcement? Well, I can't say that I'm happy that somebody sued the uh, EDPB. I can't say that I'm uh, happy that uh, it was done by one of the members. On the other hand, this is what these uh, uh, procedures were done for. So on, uh, on the other hand, as a lawyer, I'm happy that we try to check if the procedures are working and uh, if this right is given to the data protection authority that is interesting that it was in use so as far as i'm uh, um, disappointed by the fact that uh, it goes that far 
As far, I'm happy that we were ready to prepare the procedures for such situations. This is not, diff this is not surprising that the data protection authorities may have different points of views. That's normal. And the, the discussions in the European Data Protection Board are very vital discussions. And I'm not uh, ashamed of that. This is what is it for. The EDPB has been created in order to harmonize 27 at least approaches uh, that you had to the data protection law. Actually more even if you think about the members because we are 31 members of the uh, EDPB. But of course there are many more, uh, there are many more points of views. So yes, these are vital discussions. Sometimes we disagree. Sometimes we try to check uh, what uh, uh, what is the possible solution on, in all the ways. And uh, the, the mere fact that there is a case uh, between the Data Protection Commissioner from Ireland and EDPB does not mean that we are enemies. We also have a case against the European Parliament and against the Council. It doesn't mean that we are the enemies of the European Parliament as EDPS. Yeah, That's simply normal use of the procedures. Uh, and, uh, well, we'll see what the Court of Justice will say about it. Other questions? Ah, Luca. If I remember correctly, at the at your conference, uh, you said that uh, the GDPR has so far disappointed insofar as concerns the enforcement on big tech. Uh, given the recent decisions um, that we are seeing, uh, especially coming from from Ireland, uh, do you do you think that? Uh, the trend is is uh, sort of changing, or do you think that uh, there are still expectations uh, that need to be fulfilled? Well, I don't think I ever used the word disappointed uh, or disappointment uh, towards GDPR. If I did it, um, uh, I would be really surprised. But I definitely may say that there is a room for improvement. That's possible. And uh, this uh, room for improvement in the longer uh, perspective uh, definitely may exist. Uh, well, uh, the, I'm happy that uh, Data Protection Commissioner from uh, Ireland uh, is able to pr provide fi f finally uh, us with the decisions. Uh, but uh, the implementation of that and the uh, assessment of that by the complainants, uh, that's another story. So we, we still have to uh, get to know what will be the answer of those who are complaining uh, uh, to the final decision that it was done by the commissioner. And also what will be the answer of the commissioner to the uh, point of view of EDPB on that. And finally, what will be the uh, answer of the stakeholders. So assessing all that, uh, I guess, in the next term of the European Parliament and European Commission, the discussion will be still on. If this discussion will be on, we may probably think about uh, extending the role and, and, and uh, making bigger the role of the European Data Protection Board in solving those problems that are really cross-border, that are really concerning many countries of the European Union, because it seems to be, uh, it seems to be the right uh, path uh, of the development. But it doesn't mean that I'm disappointed by what we had done in the GDPR. The uh, one-stop shop system uh, was an interesting proposal and is an interesting proposal which solves most of the uh, problems connected with cross-border uh, cross examination. Thank you, Wojciech. Um, we, we still have a bit of time. So if I may, Wojciech, I would have a, a question because um, at EDPS, you have been uh, investing a lot in um, technology monitoring. So, um, uh, folk, Ali, foreseen a bit what uh, the, the technologies uh, will, will be in the future and the interaction with uh, data protection. Uh, we have been publishing many podcasts also on, on, on this topic and other topics. Um, and two specific uh, products when it comes to technology, Techno Tech Sonar and Tech Dispatch. Um, they are all available on our website. I do some publicity for it, obviously. The last edition of the Tech Dispatch was about, was about the central bank digital currency. Um, do you have something to say in general about technology monitoring and the role of DDPS, and especially about this uh, digital currency? Well, definitely, we have to be prepared uh, to the future and to the developments that will happen. That. Uh, the example of ChatGPT and the discussion about ChatGPT was the best uh, uh, 
uh, I guess, uh, to, to show that from day to day we have to answer the questions uh, uh, on the topics that we theoretically worked on, but now they, they, they uh, need uh, the fast answer. So for these reasons, we started our foresight uh, actions uh, already some years ago, and in the strategy for this mandate, uh, it was said very precisely that it's not only monitoring of the solutions which are going to the market, but also the discussion on the forest side on what will happen in the newest future. What is the uh, what is the uh, future of the technology and what is the future of the data uh, protection issues here? So tech sonar and tech dispatch are the tools for that. Tech dispatch uh, in tech dispatch we try to uh, explain in the uh, in the clear way for the EU institutions, for the EU, uh, EU clerks, what does these technologies mean? And in tech, this part, in tech sonar, looking a little bit more forehead. And the digital currencies is one of the uh, topics that are interesting for the EU, especially if we think about digital euro and introduction of digital euro, which is uh, under preparation in the European Central Bank and the European Commission. And we try to be prepared for that. We try to be in the permanent dialogue with the European Central Bank and with the European Commission on the subject. And uh, uh, both uh, me and the director of my office, uh, uh, Louis uh, uh, Leo, <laughs> Leo uh, is uh, involved in this discussion. Thank you, Wojciech. Looking at the time, I see that we have four more minutes. So I don't know whether you are ah, some. Um, I'm sorry if uh, we already spoke about the meta data transfers case, did we? No? Okay. Well, so they, they said in their um, an SEC filing last night that they expect uh, a suspension, data transfers, and a fine. Um, I wonder if you have any, any thoughts on this, but my specific question is um, if Facebook is not allowed to transfer data to the US, do you think this protects people's data? Do you think this advances the cause of protecting fundamental rights? I'm sorry, but this is not the decision which is taken by the DPS. That's the question to the European Data Protection Board. And so this, this is the uh, quite uh, precise uh, use of the one-stop shop mechanism, which we are not the members of. I would rather refrain from commenting of the uh, possible decision in this field. Okay. Even if we take part in the discussion, we are not the ones uh, that are taking part in the one-stop shop uh, system. But I would like to say two, th uh, two other uh, things. First of all, next year is the 20th anniversary of the EDPS, uh, because the institution itself was created in 2004. So uh, you will have the line of different uh, uh, involvements, I may say, because these are not events. These are involvements uh, that we are going to prepare uh, a co uh, con in connection in connection with this uh, anniversary and uh, the somehow the first one which is connected with anniversaries but this time with the fifth anniversary of the GDPR is the event that we organized together with the German Federal Data Protection Commissioner and uh, the Bavarian Commissioner in the Bavarian Permrep on 23rd of May this year uh, on 23rd of May we will try to summarize uh, the pros and cons uh, of what happened uh, uh, the last five years when GDPR is on. And I guess Kajik may say a few words more about the practicalities. Yes, thank you, Wojciech. Now just to indeed uh, invite you all to to come on the 23rd in the evening uh, to the event that will will try to create a kind of birthday uh, atmosphere, uh, which uh, is always easier to do when we go to the permanent representation, well, representation of Bavarian state in the evening with uh, certain um, drinks and, 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 and food products from Bavaria offered as well. Uh, but uh, in, indeed, the idea f for the meeting to organize together, as what you said, with, with colleagues from the German Federal DPA and the Bavarian DPA is to reflect on the um, on, on past five years in the context of uh, of new digital regulatory framework we are facing to see what does it mean for the GDPR as a, as a fundamental rights legislation uh, ultimately and you know what, what does it mean for the future for next next five years so we'll have a, a, a lineup of very high level speakers starting from 
uh, we, we wanted to gather representatives of all three institutions that created GDPR, but also the Court of Justice. So the court will be represented by the first Advocate General, Matthew Spunar. We will have Commissioner uh, Jurova and Commissioner Reinders from the Commission. We will have um, Mrs. Birgit Sippel from the Parliament and uh, colleagues from Swedish Presidency chairing Working Party on Data Protection, Sarah Ahmed. We will have Wojciech and Ulrich Kerber as, uh, and Thomas Petri uh, as DPAs and Andrea Ilinek uh, in her uh, last days of the mandate. Uh, it's going to be a very busy week. Huh? There's uh, CPDP week and uh, ADPB plenary and the elections of the... About the NGOs. And the, yeah, I'm getting there. Uh, um, but we would like you to 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 really uh, spare a moment to join us. And as Wojciech uh, reminded me, the, the voice of civil society will also be prominently present there, as the panel um, will be moderated by Estelle Masse from uh, Access Now. So uh, I think we have opened already, kind of the registration. We are not promoting it very much yet because we have our annual report and. We want those who were in touch personally, like you, to register first, to register first, before the registration is uh, is impossible because of the interest of people. But uh, for for press, for media, we always have a possibility to 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 join us. Minute, we will secure your presence in any case. So thank you very much, and see you there. Yes, uh, about this, uh, Kazik and and, and Wojciech, the invitation will be sent to you by email today. Um, so the sequence was the following: you 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 should have received uh, in your email mail, mailbox the, the the annual report of the DPS, the the executive summary, and also the press release that you have received also on paper in a paper form today. So everything has been uh, has been sent out now. So also in your mailboxes, and later in the day you will have the invitation that was just promoted here for the twenty third uh, of May in the Bavarian representation here uh, close to uh, Rüwerts. Um, and of course, you are uh, more more than welcome to to join us for that uh, uh, evening presentation and 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 good food, Bavarian food. Thank uh, you for your in interest in our activities, and thank you for interest in the fundamental rights. Thank you very much. We we stay in touch, and you know how to join us directly, uh, Olivier, Agnieszka, Francesco in the room, Alfredo, or directly to the press mailbox as usual. Thank you very much for your time, and see you soon. Bye.